This August 19th through the 21st, Audio Advice presents the premier audio and video experience. Whether you're into high-performance audio, home theater, two-channel, turntables, or headphones, Audio Advice Live is the only premier high-end audio and video show where you can experience it all. Meet face-to-face with the industry's top experts, brands, and influencers, and hear all the latest and greatest gear live and in person. Audio Advice Live. We'll see you there. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Jonathan. Great to be with everyone again. Welcome to our monthly live stream. We are really excited. Uh, I can't believe it's already August. And as you just saw, August, uh, sorry, August 19th through the 21st, Audio Advice Live, a week one week away. So we are super fired up about that. Uh, we are glad to be joined by two of our good friends from Cambridge Audio, who we'll introduce here in just a minute. Um, please let us know where it is that you're dialing in from. It's always great to see where everyone is dialing in from all over the country. Uh, and even, you know, over the sea, over across the seas and all kind of good stuff. So it's great to see where everyone's dialing in from. And it is a happy hour. So if you've got a beverage, feel free to let us know what it is that you're drinking. We always try to make this fun uh, and enjoyable for everyone. So again, we are glad to be joined by our good friends at Cambridge. Matt, we'll kick it off to you. Uh, let everybody know where it is that you're joining us from and then a little bit about what you do with Cambridge. And then a fun question, I thought, since we're going to be talking a little a bit about vinyl today, we talk a little bit about maybe your, your first record and your last record. So if you've got a, to the audience, if you've got a great record that you want to share, your first record that maybe means a lot or maybe the last one that you picked up that was really cool, go ahead and pop that in the chat. If, we are, if you're on YouTube, Facebook, uh, we can see all those comments coming in. So keep them coming. Matt, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. I had a feeling you'd ask that. So I actually pulled out my first and last record for you. No problem. Uh, but I am coming in from Seattle. Today I am drinking uh, local brew, Fremont, Sky Kraken, Hazy Pale Ale. And I'm drinking it in a Beaver Town pint glass that may or may not have been smuggled in from the UK last time I was there. So Very cool. please don't tell anybody. <laughs> Made it across <laughs> customs. That's all that matters, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for letting us be here. I'm super excited. Uh, my job title is head of business development. So I take care of North America for Cambridge Audio. Anything to do with helping amplify our message, build the brand, and um, hopefully get people into listening to some great music through our gear. Absolutely. And you guys have been great partners for many, many years. So glad to have you guys. Um, Pete, welcome. Howdy. All right. Let, yeah, let us know. Uh, for those who may not know, let everybody know where you're joining us from. It's a little bit later on, uh, in the evening on your side of the pond. So let everybody know uh, where you're joining us from. Same question. If you're drinking something cool that you want to share. And also uh, maybe, you know, first record, last record. Oh, we didn't go to this. Actually, real quick. Matt, let's go back to you. Sorry about that. Yes. So I do not have my first record. But something really great we do internally uh, at Cambridge Audio is when you sign up with Cambridge, you have to, have to, want to, get to put sort of your magic music moment into your email signature. And you sort of highlight the moment in that song that's really special to you. This took me two or three weeks. I was very upset that I had to pick one song to do that. Uh, and then I finally went with my gut and it is a uh, local band, Mud Honey, from their album, Super Fuzz, Big Muff. And there's a song on here called In and Out of Grace. And at three minutes and 18 seconds, there is a gonzo guitar solo that just sort of gets the hair going on my arms every single time. So there's no way I couldn't go with that. That's really cool. Not only you guys do like favorite song, but also like the moment that like really jumps out. That's really cool. And then, like and, you said, every, it's the start. yeah, and everybody has it. And it's, you know, we're, we're, we're very lucky in this industry to get to sort of play with gear all day and listen to music. So it means a lot to me and hopefully means a lot to others as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, we get some pretty cool toys to, to play with. So happy yeah. to share about, more about uh, some cool toys. We'll, we'll talk about here in just a minute. Pete, back to you, my friend. Yes, so hi, I'm Pete Dixon. I'm from uh, calling in from Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England. So it's nearly bedtime for me, but uh, <laughs> on the upside, it, it's not a it's not a terrible time of the day to be having a big drink. So um, I brought in this one. My, my friend brought it back from holidays. I was looking after their pets while they went away to France, and they brought me this back. And it is brewed from glacier water that came from Mont Blanc. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it is so, yeah. so it's nice, quite nice. I'm enjoying that. So I'm the technical marketing manager, um, which means I take all the information, all the specifications, all the details that come from our engineering team and new product development, 
And I've got to help our internal team understand it. I've got to help our salesmen understand it. I've got to help our distributors understand it. And I've ultimately got to help our listeners understand it too. It's a really important job because yeah. it, it's taking engineers' information and making it digestible for yeah. regular human consumption. Translating it for the rest of us, right? Absolutely right. <laughs> so Very cool. I've got my first and last record. So um, my music moment is, is, is a Queen track, Brighton Rock. And talking about guitar solos, it's that bit three minutes into the to the uh, to the track where Brian May gets to do a solo, and it's it's speaker bouncy, it's distortion, it's it it it's another one of those things which makes you go yes, yeah. <laughs> it's it's that bit. But um, so my, my first record was probably given to me by my my mum, who was a, a big pop fan in the in the eighties. It was probably something like the Pet Shop Boys or Wham or Guns and Roses. But the first one I bought myself. Was this one the Invisible Man by Queen? Ah, oh, cool. Oh, and okay. it caught my eye because it's on a see-through vinyl. Uh, Absolutely okay. love it. I had to buy it. That was my first record I bought myself. Very cool. Cool. You still the have latest, it. The latest one I bought was this one because it's yeah. heavy, well pressed, sounds yeah. great, and some of my music choices are just the ones where a, a track catches my ear and I'll go and buy the album. And that's that was a perfect example of that. It's recorded well. It sounds brilliant. I had to buy the album. Very, very cool. Love it. Thanks for sharing those. And welcome. Glad to have you. Nice Nick, you. welcome back. For those of you guys who hey. don't know Nick Rich, he's joining us again. Uh, welcome back. And let everybody know what it is that you're drinking here this evening. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nick. I am uh, a theater designer here on our online team. Uh, but I come from a two-channel vinyl background, if you can't see. I was kind of blocked on microphone with the whole stack of records here that's about a quarter of them, uh, but I'm calling out of Asheville, North Carolina, uh, and I'm drinking something local. It's a Highland uh, oatmeal porter. Really great disc golf course there, as Jonathan knows, is one of my hobbies, and so that's where I picked that one up at. But, um, you know, for first album, you know, I know I got a stack from my family whenever I was young. I started collecting when I was about 14, so I don't remember my first album, but my latest one was an FKJ album. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with FKJ, he's really great. He kind of does all the pieces himself. He has some really great samples in this album. So this is the newest one, self-titled, uh, but Way Out and Greener are probably two really good ones off this album to definitely check out. So yeah, glad to be here. Very, very cool. cool. Awesome. Uh, mine, I can't remember which one I bought first. I got in I, my first turntable, but I'll be honest with you. I got about six or seven years ago. So I haven't been into vinyl for like a super long time. Um, but when I did, I wanted to buy something like classic and then something that was fun and current that I kind of like grew up listening to. So I have yeah. the, um, obviously the Beatles, Sergeant Peppers, if you guys can see that. Yeah. And then, you know, when I grew up, this was a lot of the, oh, yeah. uh, the scores, Love it. And out, play the Fugees. And then most recently, my most recent one, um, I was at an event with another one of our partners, and they let us take a, uh, pick an album that we wanted to take. So it was the Outcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. A little bit of the uh, flavor of what I grew up listening to, I guess. And I've got, for those of you who have seen this before, Bell's Oberon, my summer beer. You really can only get it during the summer. I grew up in Michigan, so uh, it's one of my favorites, especially this time of the year. So welcome. We're excited to give away some cool stuff. Matt, back to you. We yeah. uh, encourage folks to ask lots of cool questions. We always give something away for best question. And you guys have something really cool that I want you to, you to uh, tell everyone about. We do. So last year, we put a limited pressing together uh, at a Memphis recording plant. Um, we did this in combination with Jazz's Magazine. And it is a Cambridge Audio record. And it comes in a wonderful translucent blue, which I think is quite nice. Very cool, yeah. I like to call it the uh, Cambridge Blue. So we pressed about 250 copies of those. There's some great jazz standards on there. And anybody that asks a great question, they get to have a record. That's going to be the uh, the lucky winner. We'll be able to take that home, right? Or take that with yeah. them. Very, very cool. And I can give a shout out to, to Wallace on here mentioning Jay Maskis. So he's, uh, he's, already, he's already in the lead for me. There you go. You, you take bribes, uh, I guess, as well, right? Let everybody know that. To, uh, yep. They want to exchange something in return, right? <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, today, again, one of the, a new product you guys launched not too long ago. Matt, you want to tell everyone a little bit about the, uh, the really cool turntable that you guys are going to be giving away with us? Absolutely. This just came out. It's our Alva TT V2. Um, it is a direct drive turntable with an elliptical stylus on there. It retails at, at $2,000. It has a couple of features which I think are fantastic, uh, two of which are a built-in phono stage. 
um, we know for the the moving coil magnets on, that's on there, and it does Aptex Bluetooth streaming, which by the way, we were the first in the world to do high res Aptex Bluetooth streaming. So you get the best of both, both worlds with this because both of those features are defeatable. You can turn those off. So you have your audio file bona fides, if you will, then during your late night jam sessions where everybody else might be asleep in the house, you can put your headphones on and still stream it through Bluetooth to your headphones. So it is just a killer feature all the way around. Very, very cool. I know the, the first one that you guys put out, what, 2019? 18, 19? Yeah, that sounds about right. Is that right, was, Pete? Um, Don't quote me on the dates. <laughs> yeah, they sort of also last two or three years, obviously, sort of like yeah. together. It does now. not count. Yeah. yeah, but I know that it was you know won lots of awards. It was received incredibly well, and so we'll get into maybe some of the things that you guys have introduced on this newest model um, that we're excited about excited about to give away. Which again is almost a two thousand dollar value, so really really cool. Maybe for those who aren't as familiar with Cambridge, I'm sure most people are, but there may be some folks who aren't as familiar with Cambridge. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about Cambridge, you know, some of the backstory and, and what makes you guys unique? Yeah, Pete? So Cambridge Audio has been around since 1968. Um, started in a, in, a, in, a, in a garage in Cambridge. Uh, some, some nerdy students came up with, uh, trying to come up with the, the best amplification they could for the best value they could. The, the, the culmination of that was our original P40 amplifier, the first amplifier with a toroidal transformer. 1960s, we were in a, Britain was in a cool place. It was, it was great for music. Great it was music. great for fashion. It was great for art. We had the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, the Mini Cooper, the E-Type Jag. It was all going in, 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 in the UK <laughs> at that time. And we've, we've, we've maintained our roots. We have a, 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 we've got, we've got a, a solid history of well-reviewed products, which clearly perform well with the reception they've been given. And we have an in-house team of engineers, uh, electrical engineers, acoustic engineers, and we develop all of our products in the UK, do full R&D in the UK, and then we, we, we ship out to, chi out to China for manufacturing. Uh, but all, all the research and development and tuning is done in the UK in our head office in London, right underneath the shard. Oh, we got a picture of that, I believe, as well, right? I'll pull that up. Let's see here. Oh, wonderful. Oh, nope. There it is. There it is. Right so there. If you, take, if you take the, if you look at the shard there, that really the tallest building, and if it fell over, the tip of it, we right where our office is. Very, very cool. Yeah, yes, right, yes. Right. Yeah, right downtown, right in the middle of London. In the thick of it, in the cool part of town. <laughs> very, very cool. So, in, in our head office, we we meet regularly. Not all of our meetings are about business. Some of our meetings are just about listening to music. Yeah. And that, that's our philosophy. We listen first, measure later. Our, our engineers start with listening. They, they listen to every component before they get before they get signed off. We have a couple of um, my favorite. If you can have a favorite engineer, I've got two favorite engineers. Uh, Stephen Tizard, he's the he's, he's got golden ears. And Francesco Batucci, he's he makes sure the signal paths are clean and short, and and that those are the two kind of most important parts. Of, of the process very, very but cool. like i said before we listen first we measure later and if it doesn't make us if it doesn't make us excited the, the component doesn't make the cut it doesn't, yeah and that's great you know all of all of our partners are great obviously you know we, we're in a great industry uh where, where music is sort of that common thread but anybody they've ever interacted with on the cambridge side like you know you have to uh, they don't have to tell you and you don't have to ask right it just sort of um espouses you know as part of who they are which is really cool to see and so it's sort of near and dear to your heart go ahead Nick. and every time a new product comes out you guys are coming into our stores and demoing it immediately and you know it's become a favorite around amongst you know, the sales guys since since i guess we picked you guys up i mean it's definitely for the value some of the best stuff on the market absolutely That's great thank you yeah and, and you might have noticed uh pete's got an evo behind him there this is my office system i've got, I've got an evo 75 i got one of the new turntables and the Evo S system, so it's it's not a bad little office. I've also got two pieces right over here. I've got the CXN V2 as well as the uh, 851A. Uh, so yeah, rep yeah. as well. Nick, Nick, before he started going more into home theater when he was focusing on on audio and two channel, we called it the Nick Special, which was like, you know, whatever the appropriate Cambridge electronics was with whatever was appropriate Rebel speaker. <laughs> that was like his go-to. 
which is a great yeah. combo. Which and you can see it in my together. background. Right? I mean, those, yeah, that's a great combination. Very cool. Very cool. Well, tell us about the uh, the new Alba turntable. What, you know, tell us about the name. Tell us about what's different between this and, and its predecessor. So the Alva turntable, the, the name Alva is named after Thomas Alva Edison, who invented the first one of the first wax recordings and, and played them back, more importantly. Um, so we figured that was the right, the right call. Um, our first one, like Matt said, was the first turntable to feature Aptex HD Bluetooth streaming. Um, we're still ahead of the game on that one. And of course, we listen to all our we listen to all our users, our listeners, our fans. And the biggest feedback was we'd like to be able to defeat the phono stage because we might want to put our own on. We might already have a phono stage. Um, we want to turn that Bluetooth on or off depending on our, our listening preferences. So we thought, you know what, Let, let's, let's do that for version two. But because we never sit still, we never stop listening. We also realized there was some extra benefits we could do, we, extra improvements we could make by listening to more components. We changed the tone arm because people asked us they want to make changing the head the, the the cartridge easier, so we made a removable head shell. Um, we felt that the tracking force wasn't seamlessly; it wasn't infinitely adjustable with with a clicky switch. We, we've now put a rotary dial on there. And with the improvements we've made, I think we've we've, we've come up with a, another level of, of improvements, another level of performance that we didn't have previously. Very so very cool. In in terms of what's inside it, it's. The, the Phono stage is derived from our Alva Duo Phono stage, which is already award-winning, mm -hmm. and our Alva MC moving coil cartridge, which, again, it, it's, it's been around long enough that people have got a great opinion of it. Yeah, definitely a couple of questions that, that I already saw coming in. You tell us about the Phono stage. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry, and then tell us, uh, you know, moving coil, moving magnet. So you answered both of those questions uh, with the cartridge, you know, and then obviously with moving coil, which is great. Nick, you had a question, I think, on, uh, on feed? Yeah, I think that it was, uh, let me look for it here. Steven, I think it was from Steven Bossy, I think is how you say the last name. Sorry if I butchered it. Uh, but they were asking how you maintain proper speed on the Alva tables. And you guys do something kind of interesting on your tables that not as many people do. And so I kind of want you all to talk about that a little bit. Well, it's got electronic uh, speed control. It's direct drive. Mm -hmm. and it's electronic speed control with, I forget how many poles there are, but it's basically yeah. electronically monitored to, 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 to ensure speed perfect speed stability mm -hmm. it's up to speed it doesn't get up to speed super fast it's not got one of those high torque motors because high torque motors can overshoot the, the, the correct speed this gets up to speed and maintains it yeah and that was one thing that really impressed me with yours because whenever i hear direct drive i think about like you know the old like sl series from you know tech uh, techniques and everything and so you think yeah. about dj tables going up to speed really quickly but they have a lot of speed variants mm -hmm. and you know the way that you guys kind of combined the direct drive motor as well as a really heavy platter yeah, which I'm sure you guys will end up going into as well. You know, it makes it's the perfect combination. Yeah, that that um, that platter is really heavy in itself, heavy and dense. It's made of polyoxymethylene, which we shortened to POM, and it's used in uh, engineering applications that require high dimensional stability. So it, it's not going to move. It's not going to change shape. It's it's dense and it's it keeps that turntable running at a uh, constant speed. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any um... <clears throat> information from your user base on like what percentage they they do listen to it via the most you know more traditional vinyl uh route versus um, or uh, versus bluetooth like analog versus bluetooth. analog versus that's, bluetooth. A, that's a good question um i know i don't have that information i don't know if we do pete might know better than i i don't think we collect that kind of information but we certainly get lots of feedback or just feedback. Across numerous yeah. numerous outlets the um, our listeners tend to like sending posting pictures of themselves listening so it, it tends to be on a friday evening as well and uh, they, they they're often laying back on on the comfy chair with their headphones on um yeah. and if you know uh, so there's a lot of people use them with with expensive headphones because mm -hmm. i suppose bluetooth is at a point now where it's better than it was and it, it's 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 a re it's a relevant choice for listening now so we're, we're getting lots of feedback about how good it is to listen to their vinyls through Aptex HD and a, and a posh set of headphones. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it depends, honestly, you know, what, what time of day is it? If yep. it's 7 o'clock at night, you know, it's through my speakers. If it's 11 o'clock at night and it, you know, and I'm playing, I'm playing, you know, 80s thrash metal, then it's, it's my headphones. <laughs> Let's not forget as well, um, 
there's a lot of people who want to have their place looking really smart and they don't want to look at hi-fi components. Yeah. But yeah. a single turntable on a on a posh cabinet with no other means of connection, that's also really attractive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, and your Bluetooth isn't normal Bluetooth. You know, the you know, Aptex HD, which I was waiting to see some questions about already, but uh, we had a few about compatibility, but you know, Aptex HD is you know, really interesting, you know, the way that Qualcomm did it. Maybe you guys can touch on that a little bit. Well, yeah, I think with Aptex, I mean, you're getting 1644, right, for resolution. Um, of course, there's, you know, higher resolutions with certain high res downloads. But again, we're trying to really combine convenience with quality. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what, you know, Aptex Bluetooth does, does for you. And I just saw a question roll through about which headphones match well with it. Mm -hmm. I can't say I have a few different pairs from a few different brands. Um, my, it, it, it just depends on what. Depends on your musical styles, really. I, I, I have, I have different opinions on different days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and for me, it's, you know, has to work first. <laughs> so it has to yeah. work good, look good and sound good. Is those, those three combinations. So, so and, and also in terms of Aptex HD, you have to have the transmitter and receiver to both be compatible, right? To get the full resolution. Correct. Yeah, absolutely right. But it's also fully backwards compatible with all Bluetooth standards. Yep. So yep. up to and including Aptex HD. Perfect. Very cool. Uh, let's see here. We'll, we'll start cranking away a couple of questions again. Keep those questions coming. It's great to see questions coming from all over. So we'll get through as many as we can. Why? Um, one, I guess, tell us about setup. You know, how easy is the setup? What do you need? What do you need to get started? You know, just plug it in, you're good to go. As you mentioned, Pete, you know, sometimes with traditional um, vinyl, there's there's a lot of complexity in terms of, you know, I need, I need you know, all the gear that goes with it, right? So tell us about the setup for, for the Alba turntable. In, in terms of setting it up in the first place when it's out the box, it's probably a five-minute process maximum from opening the box to getting it playing. Um, it involves uh, putting the head shell on, which is really, really swift with the, with the uh, detachable head shell. Uh, deciding whether you need the phono stage on or off, and really whether you connect it with a pair of cables or, or pair it with a Bluetooth device. Yep. It's it's that simple. Um, the go. most difficult bit, I suppose, is setting the tracking force. It needs a tracking force of two grams. You've got to put the weight on, measure it with a little seesaw device till it says two, and that's you done. That's the most difficult part. Yeah. Um, I've I've seen people who didn't think they could do it manage it's it's that you know it, it's not the easiest thing you've ever done in hi-fi but it's also nowhere near as, as difficult as you think it is yeah absolutely yeah, I mean, we've got good videos as well for setup you know to, to help people with the um, balancing certainly everything. we've got some setup videos too so up between audio advice and cambridge audio we should be all set make it super simple for folks yeah matt sorry were you about to, what were you about to say Oh, basically, it's like, Pete, like Pete said, it's not the most challenging, but it's, you know, the, the directions are very clear. Take a listen. Does it sound right? And then you're pretty much off and running. Pete, you're already getting questions about your shirt. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. What's the question? Where did you get that epic shirt? I got it as a present from a friend last year. Does anybody know where it's from? Let's hope so. Let's see if we can hold out for if anyone knows. We've already uh, we've already answered it backstage, so we know. We need to yeah. chat. So you guys, you guys in chat, put it in. In no, terms no. of the uh, in terms of the, the the subject matter, it's a band T-shirt. Yeah. Yo, we got it already. Somebody got it. Uh, yeah. Oh, there it is, Timothy. Oh, and Nabuji. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And we'll, we'll probably have a little bit more to share on that here in just a little bit as well. With the, Absolutely. You guys Robert have. Scranton. <laughs> Matt, what, since we teased it out, why don't you guys have a pretty cool announcement that's uh, relevant to where we're at right now? We really do. It's um, it, it really is exciting and lots of fun, but we are going to be partnering with DeLorean and their new EV model. So, oh, perfect timing. There it is. It is a, an amazing looking car. Um, it's you know, the one I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, we got to sell some more turntables first. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we're very excited and really proud to be part of DeLorean, their heritage, and what they're doing with this car. In fact, I'll be in Pebble Beach next week um, setting up some systems for DeLorean and uh, looking forward to having some fun with it. So, yeah, we're, we're excited. Very, very cool. Yeah, super exciting. Obviously, 
the DeLorean name and brand uh, probably means a lot of us that grew up in during that time uh, a couple decades ago, which was really, really cool. All right, let's keep the questions coming again. Guys, if you see something that you want to uh, that jumps out that you want to address, feel free. We knew we had a little uh, wager if, if the uh, the flux capacitor reference was going to come up. So it is, I see it didn't take long, right? <laughs> 88 miles an hour from Philip. This is ideal. Love Great it. roll. All right, we'll keep them coming. The turntable only does 33 and 45. Sorry. Doesn't yeah. 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 Well, the you know, a lot of people ask about that. So 78s, you typically need a different cartridge with. Um, and so if you try to play, you know, a 78 on a standard cartridge, you're going to eat that thing up in no time or probably damage the album. One of the two. So yeah, don't, don't try to find a shellac cause they're, they're made out of a different material. They're not vinyl or shellac. And so yeah. it's, it's two different things. So just avoid 78s, hang them up, put them on your wall. They're cool, but don't try to play them. If, yeah. If, if people are wanting to play 78s, they already know that kind of stuff. It, it wouldn't, yeah. If, if you're trying to play 78s yourself, you'd need mm -hmm. a whole lot of different equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And there's really, you know, even on a good setup, uh, somebody out here might kill me and tell me I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, 78s don't sound that good. You know, the shellac, the noise floor is super high on it. And so anytime you play it, it's going to be really loud for the most part. I mean, I've had new pressings of 78s. They did an Elvis release of like his first recordings and yeah. still sounded awful, even on the right setup. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time. Let's see. Uh, the Raven 762, he asked, I use the external preamp. How would you rate the Alba V2 preamp? And like, when would you recommend maybe somebody using their existing or do you feel like, hey, it's sufficient and it's going to... I've got go the answer. Yeah. Listen to it. <laughs> That's the best answer, isn't it? Like, get, get them together. Turn the phono stage off on the Alva TT and, and try, your, uh, try your external one. Listen to them side by side. It's the best way. Yeah, and, re and realistically, it's you know, everybody's ear shape a little bit different. We all have a different reference point. So if it sounds good, go with that. Uh, you know, I will say that the Alva built into it is based on our own external preamp, which is Pete mentioned earlier is award-winning. So it's no slouch on its own, right? So again, you've got the convenience of not having an extra box or an extra cable. However, you can absolutely do that too, because, you know, I vacillate between convenience and then, Ooh, what can I do differently? How can I make this just a little bit better? Um, you know, try a different photo stage, add a different cable. And it's uh, it's fun having it both ways. Try a different cartridge. It's, it's yeah. all about choice in it. Yep. Yeah. And the Duo is one that we sell, you know, a ton on, on our online side. It's a really popular phono preamp by itself to go with a lot of different types of turntables. So it's not just the standard, you know, built-in phono preamp that would come on an entry-level table. You know, this, you guys have definitely put thought into this. The signal path is huge for Cambridge. So yeah, you guys have really put thought into it. And the engineering was done by Francesco on that one. He made those signal paths short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think, you know, the one reason that somebody, you know, maybe would want to swap it out is if you were to get a low output moving coil, um, you know, cartridge, because... I'm pretty sure these are tuned for high output moving coil and moving magnet cartridges. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So that would be the the one exception. And, you know, would you guys want to go into kind of the difference between, I, I've seen some people talk about moving coil versus moving magnet so far, would you guys kind of want to go into that? Sure. So moving magnet offers a higher output to the, into the uh, deck in the first place. Um, so it's, it's easier to amplify using a phono stage. Moving coil is, more difficult because it's much more sensitive and it offers a much lower output. So it, it's difficult. It, it's quite a broad range between low output and high output. And therefore you would need it, a low output moving coil cartridge would output quite quietly on a, on a Alva TT version two, um, which is why we specify high output because quite simply the phono stage has to amplify that up to line level. And it can only, it can only do that with high output and moving magnet. That's awesome. Let's see. Um, so, let's see. So we had a few different questions. Um, so how did you, this is from Charles Whaley. Uh, can you discuss the sound and vibration isolation incorporated? So basically how you guys isolated the table. Oh, so underneath the, the, the solid aluminum platter, underneath there is all, all the damping. Uh, so for starters, the solid aluminum platter and the, sorry, plinth, and the, the palm platter are all isolated. And inside the, the deck, underneath the, aluminum, the heavy aluminum platter, there's the isolation in there, as well as the feet there up there. Um, while they're not really spongy, 
they are, I think they were measured, they were measured intensely to make sure that they matched, they were just the right amount of spring to, to, to damp the uh, vibrations coming from the, from the uh, platter. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I mean, whenever we had those tables, I always kind of do the tap test uh, whenever we demo. So even on the first Alva, whenever, because I, you know, I helped write the review on the very first one. And so whenever we got it in, we were super excited about it. And so I always had to put on the table, play through some speakers, tap on the table in different spots, just to see how much those vibrations would transfer through. And it did a killer job. That's great. Yeah. And then ah. you guys speak a little bit to the differences between you know the, the original version ST versus the, the new version. So the, uh, the original uh, turntable, uh, you couldn't turn off the phono stage and you couldn't turn off the Bluetooth. Um, I saw a question in, in the comments there before, which said, uh, when you turn off the Bluetooth, does it eliminate the, the circuitry? And yes, it does. It elim eliminates that little bit of circuitry, should you want that. So in terms of the differences between the Alva TT version 2 and the Alva ST, <coughs> they both have the same Bluetooth Aptex HD, which is switchable. They both have the same built-in phono stage, which is switchable. They both have our new tone arm, which is high mass, low resonance with a removable head shell. The Alva TT version two is direct drive. The Alva ST is belt drive. And the cartridge on the Alva TT version two is a high output moving coil cartridge. And the cartridge on the Alva ST is moving magnet. Very cool. So you have both options now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very, very cool. Also, that's a great side by side comparison. You know, it makes it really simple for people to understand what's the best, you know, for their situation, their scenario, and you know what it is that they're looking for. Very uh, cool. We, Keep the questions coming. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, we had a question from Calvin. They they said, "Can you guys explain why the tone arm was changed from this model to the other?" I think we kind of touched on it, but you know, can you guys go through and uh, describe those differences one more time? It's all about continual improvement. When you know, when we were listening to the component choices, we had the new tone arm sounded better. We, we enjoyed that more. And alongside having to put that with a moving magnet and a moving coil, we enjoyed the new tone arm combination better. And let's not forget the, the bias dial, which helps us to um, counteract the, 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 the force of the, the tone arm being pulled towards the center mm -hmm. of the record. That was a switch in the previous tone arm. And now it's, a, it's like a rotate, rotation dial, which has finer adjustment as well. So there was a the matter of adjustment, adjustability and sound quality. Got it. And so for that bias, you know, how do you guys recommend for your customers to set up that bias? Because that's that's one thing that's kind of confusing for people. It's okay. So as the as the record's spinning, the, the the needle is pulled towards the middle of the record, which which makes the needle want to touch one side of the groove or the other. And so you turn the bias dial to match the weight of the the, the weight and the counterweight of the cartridge and, and, and the counterweight. And that's two grams of tracking force on the torn arm. So we need to bias that with two grams of, 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 of bias. Yeah. Yeah. Cause what, one way that I've always tested it too, is you get just like a blank album that's because you know, there's sometimes three sided albums and I know it sounds weird, but yeah. you have one that's double sided and then one that's only got pressing on one side, the other side's completely blank. So sometimes I'll set my cartridge on there and you can see if that starts to skate down to the middle quickly, you can tell your bias is off, but if it just kind of hovers there, you're good. Yeah. 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 There's a few ways to test that. Uh, let's see. Crit Chat asked if we have the Alva on display in Raleigh and Charlotte. The answer is yes. We will have the we have it up on display, and we'll also have it at Audio Advice Live. Cambridge will be joining us here in a couple in a couple of days, uh, one week away. So you guys will have it there. So if you want to come and see it, if you're in the Triangle or passing through North Carolina on the way to the beach or the mountains, definitely stop by one of our two showrooms. And this is great to see. You know, there's a lot of great questions for folks who've obviously been into vinyl for a long time, but then there's a lot of folks who are sort of new and and have some some questions uh, that maybe. Other folks may know, or maybe they haven't had answered before. So here's a great one from Michael. He asked, um, last time I had a turntable, the concept of a photo stage was not an issue. Can you explain the concept for someone who's basically just getting into vinyl, which is a great sort of question that a lot of people may not know the answer to or just getting into vinyl. Absolutely. I can take that one. So sure. um, the the information on a, on a vinyl is, is all analog, and it's retrieved by the small needle on the end of the the the, the style the, the stylus on the end of the the, the tone arm and it, it's a really really small signal so the job of a phono stage is to amplify that small signal up to line level so our amplifiers can understand it the same level as a cd player for instance now that if it, it doesn't just have to make it louder you know that's quite an easy job but the important part of 
a phone on stage is the reintroduction of something called the RIAA curve, which is the Record Industry of America Association um, curve, which is an agreed set of, it's like a, the original codec, I suppose. If, if all of the audio information was on the grooves of your record, the grooves would be really wide. So they have, they have to cut out some of the, 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 the audio information to the shape of a groove, to, which is on a graph. It, it's, it's like that when in, in, the, in the pressing process some of the audio information is removed. And during the, the phono stitch has to reintroduce that in the opposite curve. So it's not just a matter of making it louder. It's got to it reinsert audio information back into the, into the signal, which is not just, it's not just a simple job. And a cheap or not very well made phono stage wouldn't do a good job of that. And therefore you have to consider it seriously when you're buying a, a, a phono stage or it, making a built-in one indeed. You've got to make yeah. sure that's done properly. Well, and to add on to what Pete was saying, I mean, it, it, we, you know, we, we all know that, you know, loud doesn't necessarily mean good, you know, <laughs> more information. The real test is, you know, are you getting, you know, full signal at, at low levels? Are you getting detail at low levels? Uh, if you are there, then as you turn it up, therefore that should continue along the way. So. But a big part of the phono preamp, you know, too, is to reduce noise. And having it directly inside of that turntable, you guys, we, I, I keep on talking about signal path. It's one of the most important yeah. things in design. Uh, but, yeah. you know, by having it already in that table, you're able to have full control over that. And so you can keep that noise as low as possible. Your engineers are testing it to make sure the noise is low, as low as possible. And really, yeah. the, that's one of the biggest parts of a phono preamps job because you're taking a super tiny signal blowing it up and amplifying it. And if you have a piece of noise that's really quiet in there, it's going to amplify that. And, and so rubbish, yeah. rubbish in the signal gets louder as well. Exactly. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. And so, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's a, that's a big part of it. Uh, we had a quick says, sorry, I'm, Nick, I'll give you a second. He says, uh, I've had a turntable probably 35 years. I still have some records for some reason. Like if you haven't had listened to a turntable in a long time, it's a great time to maybe pick one up. Uh, especially like the Cambridge Alba dust off those records. And, uh, and give it a whirl. I think you'll really love it. There's nothing like sitting down, you know, listening to a record from start to finish, you know, the way oftentimes the artist intended to record the album. It's, it's a lot of fun. And so certainly a great way to get back into it. Um, Nick, I'm sorry, you had a you comment or question you wanted to? Well, to touch on that too, you know, the diff everybody's always like, oh, well, you know, which one's better, digital or analog? There's a million different answers to it. But at the end of the day, you can't, it's really hard to beat the experience of an album. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that sounds, it's, it sounds kind of cheesy, but really it's the truth. You know, there's a, do I buy, you know, random albums to play in my system downstairs because it necessarily sounds better or anything like that? You know, it can, it really depends. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's about the experience of being able to have it, being able to actually own your music, because as we get into streaming more and more, we're becoming detached from our music. And so being able to listen to the album front to back, tell that story, have the experience with it. It's it's huge. Yeah, Nick. And I, I, I love that you said that because I 100% agree because, you know, I stream all the time. I either stream or I play vinyl. Uh, I also collect cassettes, believe it or not. Um, but it is about that connection and music. It's 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 primal. It's motive. It's you know, emotion. Um, and, you know, having new vinyl, I didn't mention the one they got recently, but it's a, it's a record from Sacred Bones out of, out of Brooklyn record label. And, you know, it, it sounds great. It's great artwork on it. And it's, you know, it's red. Right? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's part of the fun. It's part of the fun. And it's part of the experience, like you said, and turntables, they're meant to be inconvenient. You know, I have to get up <laughs> and walk over and, Flip the record and clean it, and uh, it's, it's a ceremony to put the record on. When yeah. I put a record on, I listen to the entire, entire thing. When I'm streaming, I'm skipping. I'm not listening. Mm -hmm. yep. but when I'm yeah. when I'm listening to a record, I listen to the full to the full album. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. One of the comments, uh, just real quick, I was going to make because I remember a lot of our sales team. Uh, we oftentimes would deal with this when we first started selling a lot of turntables to folks who are virtual via our online e-commerce business. And they'd, they'd leave a comment, something like, hey, I just got a turntable and I hooked it up to my powered speakers and I can just barely hear this faint noise, right? Like, I can't really hear what's going on. Like, what's going on? And, and that was like, that, that's kind of the perfect explanation of why you need that, that phono stage, you know, to, to convert that sound. You did a really good job explaining, Pete. But we would get that a lot. Maybe just to explain to folks, there's, you, know, you either need a phono already, stage. Yeah, yeah. There's already some people, uh, there's been a couple of questions to our support department. Whilst listening through Bluetooth headphones or speakers, it's really quiet. Well, you've got to turn the Bluetooth on, uh, the phono stage on, because the phono stage has to be on for Bluetooth to work properly. 
That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so that that's really cool that it it's defeatable. Like, and so whenever it's defeatable, it even defeats the Bluetooth. So that just shows the Bluetooth after that in the signal. Pack. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Uh, somebody, Rick Davis, was asking. Said, "Is there a difference between the platter masks or in the platter materials between the two models?" And you guys kind of touched on this. So kind of go between the two because, yeah, between the Alva ST and the TJ. Yeah. So the um, the Alva ST has a an aluminium platter which is die cast. And it's got a thick rubber mat on top of it, whereas the Alva TT version two has a, a one-piece polyoxymethylene platter, which is heavier, more dense. Yes, there's a definite difference between the two. That's to do with the price as well. But let's be honest: it's, we've got belt drive and an aluminium platter with a rubber mat versus direct drive with a with a heavy POM platter on top. Maybe you can just uh, elaborate a little bit more on the difference between direct drive and belt drive for folks. Certainly. So with direct drive, the motor is directly attached to that spindle, which spins the platter. And with, with, a, and with a belt drive, the motor is off to one side, connected with a belt that goes around the bottom of the, of the, of the platter. So it's, it's decoupled from the, the, the platter is decoupled from the motor. Very, very cool. Yeah. Well, it was interesting whenever you guys first brought those in. Uh, I, you know, a lot of us sales guys, we've got strong opinions. You know, whenever we see a new product and we Same. make the mistake, you know, because we're all human of not listening to it first, we see direct drive and we're like, mm, direct drive. And uh, I think it was Bob uh, from Cambridge that came in and he said, uh, he was like, we're not trying to make a statement by doing direct drive. We're not necessarily saying direct drive's the, you know, the best in the world, but our engineers loved it in this use case. And so he played it. And like I said before, the speed consistency is great on this. We did not have a single issue whatsoever. And so okay. man, I will, I will say it somewhat changed uh, my mind and a lot of the other sales guys mind on direct drive. That's good to hear. Very cool. I always put, I always put direct drive down to expensive or niche turntables. You know? mm -hmm. uh, this actually, you know, Matt, you showed your, your, um, was it the Brooklyn record you had the red one? Yeah. Someone asked you a lot of colored vinyl. Does that impact the sound at all? Your that's I, I, you know it's an interesting question I, and i think yeah. you know like you know ours is on you know ours is blue this is red and i think that sort of comes from you know the heyday of hi-fi and when i i think it was a bigger question maybe late 70s early 80s i'm not positive mm -hmm. um and i truly can't say i don't know but i'm i'm a very visual person so i'm a sucker for a special yeah. edition you know colored vinyl so i'm gonna get it um do I really know? I don't know. But again, I love the experience. Love, love playing it. You yeah, I don't know the answer either. Honest, I can man. probably tap on that a little bit. So, oh, yeah. you know, vinyl by itself is pretty much colorless. And so pretty much everything's going to have some type of dye in it. And so uh, long story short, colored albums don't really impact it. Now, some of the picture discs are low quality. You know, they're, they're absolutely heavy. They, they're actually two pieces pressed together. So picture discs are a different story. But yeah. for color itself, no. Um, and you know, a lot of the bad pressings, like most people that are pressing albums now from, you know, are pretty reputable. Uh, you know, there was a time whenever there was, you know, shortages, like oil shortages and people were using a lot of recycled materials in their album. And so that's where you got, you know, the Dynaflex albums from the seventies, which were really thin. They didn't sound that good. And then you got a lot yeah. of ones that were made out of recycled material, super high noise floor. Um, but today, you know, that most of the pressing plants that still survived it, they're really clean. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think the, the the pressing makes such a big difference. You know, mm -hmm. I've picked up vinyl where I'm like, this doesn't sound, it's like something's wrong, right? It's just not the same. And I'll buy a new version of it and was done in a different pressing plant. And that was it. That was it right, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, very cool. Uh, let's see, we'll get through a couple more, couple more questions here. Keep the questions coming. We got a uh, good one right here from Sheree Kundra, maybe? Uh, she said, how do you know when a cartridge has uh, met the end of its life cycle? That's a good question, yep. It, it's difficult to spot that because it, it builds up over time, doesn't it? So it, it, it's going to be a duller sound or a stereo imbalance. Yeah, it kind of, you, you've got to kind of be able to judge it against the first day you heard it versus today. Mm -hmm. um, right. we, we think that the Alva MC cartridge has a, a, a good life of about a thousand hours of listening. That, that's about right. So yeah. but I think it would be very difficult to measure that because, it, like I say, it builds up over time, the, the, the degradation of the stylus. 
yeah. a thousand dollars is a good, good amount. Without a microscope, it's mm -hmm. really hard to, you know, look at that the diamond tip on there because you know the the tip shape because what what tip shape do you guys have on this one? Elliptical. Is it elliptical? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's impossible to really see that with the naked eye, but you know whenever it does get worn down, you can either notice like you said, the stereo effect, because one side is usually worn down more than another. But if that's part of really proper calibration of the table. If you have your tracking force, you know, properly set, you're not putting too much pressure on those albums. You're not too, putting too much pressure on that stylus. And then also the bias. So you're not riding more to one side versus the other. It's just sitting right there directly in between. So no, I think that a thousand hours probably is a good amount of time for it. Yeah, if you're just getting into vinyl, it's actually pretty cool. There's some really cool YouTube videos out there that show, you know, the needle, whether it's diamond or elliptical, and how it's reading the information, you know, on the groove of the of the record, which is really cool and all that good stuff. So, yeah, you can you can go down the rabbit hole, right, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and well, and then you know, a thousand hours. It just depends on how often are you, are you spinning, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. All right, cool. Uh, someone asked if you had one track, one vinyl track that you were going to use for your demo. What would be what would be your go to? Give me a minute. So, so for demo or a track that I love, there's a difference. All right, let's go with a demo. Um, so off the top, I mean, there's there's so many, but there's off the top of my head, the Radiohead 2007 in Rainbows Nude. Uh, I think that track is amazing. Yeah. Um, cool. You know, his his voice is just so interesting, and what they're doing with instrumental electronics, uh, it's I think it's wonderful, pretty powerful. Very cool. Nick's got his, if you can read right above his head, he's, he's got a favorite track that he always likes to play. For yeah, him. everybody likes to talk about this. Everyone always asks me, said, Nick, are you from California? And so I've got a sign here that says no Hotel California. Uh, <laughs> it's a reference to, well, Wayne's World. So in the in the guitar shop that they go into, he has no stairway to heaven because it's the most overplayed song when demo yeah. guitars um, or playing guitars. I don't know. Uh, and in the world of hi-fi. Hotel California is way ever played, so I've got a no it's Hotel California sign in mind. I, I, I from a from a heavy retail background, I worked in retail, hi-fi retail for fifteen years, and I got sick of Hotel California pretty quickly. <laughs> it's, it's a shame because I like the tune, but sorry. Yeah, it's a great song. You know, the first three hundred times you hear it. You know, for nothing, anything by Diana Krall. You know, mm -hmm. there you go. That's some good ones. So I, I was listening to The Carpenters recently. The, we got an album with the Philharmonic Orchestra and Rainy Days and Mondays is brilliant on on that version. The vocals dead center, the, the, the orchestra sounds balanced. That's a real cool demo track on vinyl, that is. Well, cool. it's an interesting thing to touch on too, that different albums and different pressings of the same mm -hmm. album can have different sounds. So it's like you'll see kind of like first edition of books, everybody saw like, you know, they're most sought after. But, you know, first pressings of albums are really sought after because people think that it's, you know, the best quality version that, that what the artist initially intended. And so everything can have different sounds. I mean, I've got, uh, you know, first pressings of like, let's say Bob Dylan, like his his first album, uh, self-titled sounds horrible. The first pressing does. Uh, and then MoFi remastered it and repressed it. And it sounds far better. Um, so. You know, but that's a whole other can of worms. But yeah, that's it's different. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, that's an interesting point too because I think on our side of it, on the playback, on the listening, right, as a as a fan, an audiophile, you know, so much of it you attribute to the gear, the system you put together. But there's a huge portion of it where the sound engineer for the record, you're hearing what they what they created, what they what they intended. So there's certain albums that might sound hot or might sound a little bit abrasive because they wanted a certain emotion or feeling in that. So sometimes I think it's hard to balance out what the artist's intentions were, what the record or what the recording engineer's intentions were, and then what we're actually listening to sometimes. But mm -hmm. that's also part of the fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. A good question. Um, how can you tell if a record is high quality pressing? Are there certain things, record makers, that are the gold standard? Because a lot of folks are asked, like, what do you mean by like a quality pressing versus one that's not, right? Nick, you want to share your thoughts yeah. first and we'll go around if anybody else has anything to add? Yeah, there, so there's a lot to it. Um, you know, source material is one of those things that everybody talks about. Um, source material not doesn't always have to be the master tapes. I'm going to say that. Uh, it, it Vinyl itself inherently has a different sound just because of the mechanism in which, is, which it's played. That's how it is. If you get a super high res digital, it goes over... 
No, we lose Nick there. Did I lose you guys? Sorry. Yeah, I, I dropped out for a second. Yep. I was just starting my rant. That was a sign for me to cut it short, I guess. Uh, so, yes, the source material was a huge piece of it. But different plants also have you know different weights of their albums, uh, which is something really important to look for. Um, so you always see 180 gram. That's important. Uh, and then there are certain pressing plants once you get really nerdy into you know, which pressing plants do the best quality albums. Um, and MoFi, you know, hands down, is one of the best you know, pressing companies out there on the market. Um, you know, I've played their albums side by side against original, you know, original pressings, and they sound better. So they're one of my favorites uh, you know, much of the time. Very yeah, cool. and I think, and just to, again, to tag on to what you said, Nick, and I, I think it's really smart, the weight does matter. At the end of the day, you know, I'll, you know, support the artist, get the vinyl, regardless of weight, you know, play it, enjoy it, have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of indie bands too that, you know, press their albums and they go and get them done as cheaply as possible. But I still like having it because at the end of the day, you're owning a physical piece of merch and you're owning a physical piece of music. It's really cool. Yep. Yep. And you get good art, you know, like look at things like this, you know, you get like gatefold albums and, you know, you have, you know, photographs that you open up, you have, uh, you know, lyric sheets, you're not going to get that, you know, on digital the same way. Yeah. Again, like you said, it's, it's that ritual. It's the experience. Mm -hmm. Very cool. We'll keep the questions coming. We've got time for a couple more. Let's see. And I, I know one thing we haven't really talked much about, obviously we focused on the, on the album TT for obvious reasons, but maybe for those folks who don't know as much about, you know, Cambridge, you know, some of the electronics that you guys focus and do so well on. I know a lot of our sales team, you know, you ask those guys, you know, like Nick is a perfect example, what it is that they have, um, you know, whether it's an AX series or maybe, and a lot of folks have the, the, um, the edge series, right? So those, mm -hmm. this is a great, great um, integrated amp. So maybe tell a little bit about that for folks who may not know. Yeah. So uh, actually, Pete, do you mind talking about Professor Edge? Golden Edge. Is, <laughs> is the name. Yeah, that's the, that's the name of the, uh, the guy who, the founder of, of, of Cambridge Audio, the guy, who, the guy in the shed in the yeah. 60s was, was Professor Edge. And we thought it was fitting to put his name to the, to the best thing we've ever made. And it was, we, we had to think back um, to what our roots were. You know, what would you, we said to our engineers, what would you make if, if cost was no object? But also let's not forget that we listen first and measure later. And the, and the culmination of that was the Edge series. Um, and we basically ripped up the rule book on what we what we do as, as, a, as a company and we said let's let's build what we think is is, is, a, is a suitable pinnacle of our range and that's where that's what edge that's that's what where edge came from uh, we cost was no object but like I said before we, we we listened first before we made any measurements every single component had to undergo rigorous blind testing with, with 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 our panel of listening experts all the ones with golden ears and if it didn't move them the component didn't make it didn't make it yeah one of our sales guys uh, marty if he's listening has he's got the cambridge edge stack with a pair of martin logan 13 a's 11 a's or 13 a's i can't remember but it's it's awesome you know, he's been in the industry for a long time he swears by it you know it's the best system he's like it's like his dream system right and that's what he has and like I said, you know, Cambridge Edge, that's what he decided to go with. So that's, that's great. Cool. And he's traveling to Logan's with those. I'm glad to hear yeah. that. Yeah. That's exciting. It's a great Thank you. for sure. <laughs> makes yeah, me feel my, uh... when salesmen say, I've got, I've got your equipment. I've got one of your CXA 81s or one of your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 851As. It, it makes me feel good when, when, when salesman chooses our products. Yeah. And the Evo is incredibly popular. I know you guys both have that, that uh, the Evo. That's a yeah. great popular as well. Yeah. Very, very versatile. Yeah. yeah so, well, so I will say cutting edge lifestyle you know it's, it's got everything in one box and right. yet it's not it's not one of those cheap one box systems if you if you look around the back it's got proper balance connections on the back with proper hi-fi connections and well, it, you know it, it's it's a serious bit of audio equipment in a it, it, absolutely, it absolutely is and what, what i really like about it is you know I, I live in a pretty tiny place so i don't have a lot of room for a huge 5.1 or 7.1 or you know 32 channel system um, and I love, you know, I love hi-fi. So it has an arc input so I can connect it to a, you know, nice flat screen yep. and do a really solid, well set up 2.1 system. And that, that fits a lot of needs, especially if you love music, but want your, you know, TV shows and movies to sound 
a bit better than TV speakers. Yeah, absolutely incredibly versatile. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, you guys don't have you know just an absolute ton of products, but you cover you know every single one very well. So it's like for the person who wants a really clean, almost all in one type setup, you have the Evo. You have the very geeky, you know hi-fi want everything to be perfect you have the edge and then you have sort of like your mid-level which is like your your cx series yep. and you know everyone is done really well and so like i said i'm still running the 851a um you know my speakers just to kind of put it into perspective you know these are you know, retail a little over seven thousand dollars for the speakers and that's a fifteen hundred dollar amp keeping up with it i'm running that through pass through through a receiver <laughs> so okay. a receiver is running its preamp out into that amp because i still love that amp so much i can't justify upgrading it yet so yeah that's a that's a huge statement it's a great amp all right very cool yeah uh appreciate this shout out to jesse and charlotte someone said i bought mine from jesse and charlotte so that's really mm -hmm. cool to see yep that's our right. team our sales team whether it's online or in the store they all speak incredibly highly of cambridge so it doesn't surprise me one bit so that's great to see all right maybe time for uh one more we've got the full review of the evo as well that we just linked to if you want to check that out uh let's see here Nick, anything else jump out at you? Um, I, I mean, I think we covered a lot of the really good ones. We got a ton of good questions. No, there's, um, a, there's a great one from Phil Simpson. Go ahead, Matt. What is the best cocktail to consume while listening to your turntable? <laughs> That's up for debate, but go ahead and give us your thoughts. That is, oh, no, no, no. I've got it. And I told Pete uh, what it was earlier today. I need one. Uh, so I have a, a, it's something I put together. It's a marmalade gin with, um, a little bit of tonic, iced yeah. tea, a lot of mint leaves. So I, I call it a body rock. I'm a tonic guy for sure. So I have to take you up on that sometime. <laughs> I don't know. I may have some opinions on that. So I, I make my drinks like I do my demos. So if somebody comes over and they don't know music, then I play a really bass heavy demo, one that's really fun that could just shake the room. They're like, oh, this is awesome. And, you know, that person gets a drink like a uh, Kentucky milkshake, which is like Kahlua, uh, bourbon and Godiva chocolate. Very simple, very sweet. And then you got the person that's more refined and they want to hear soundstage and, you know, right. proper tonality, all of that, you know. They're going to probably bourbon. get uh, yeah, bourbon neat. Yeah. So there you go. All right. I love it. <laughs> Very cool. All so, right. Go we, ahead. We did, a, we did a show in Poland where we, we were demonstrating our equipment to our Polish dealers, and they all drank vodka whilst we listened. <laughs> yeah, I'm not right. <laughs> Very, very cool. Hey, guys, this has been a ton of fun. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. These go by so fast. We get more questions than we can. Uh, we could go on for hours, obviously. So this is always a lot of fun. Matt, Pete, thank you guys so much for, for joining us and for being such time. great thank partners. You. Matt, do you want to pick the winner for our best question for your special edition jazz? Oh, that is fantastic. What? Um, I, I got to go with the cocktail person. I have to. I thought that was my favorite. And not everyone's going to say, that was me. That was me. So we'll figure out exactly who that was. Yeah. yeah. Best cocktail to go with. Uh... Hands down. I mean, it's, it's easy. It's a no-brainer. All right. Good awesome. Stuff. All right. And then our winner for our almost $2,000 value turntable here is, we'll get a little virtual drum roll here. Richard, thank you, Richard uh, Hankins from Oklahoma. So, Richard, you are our big okay. winner this evening. Congratulations. We will uh, connect with you and get that out, shipped out to you here real, real soon. Don't forget, if you're in the Carolinas, come check out our stores in Raleigh, Charlotte. And, of course, we have Audio Advice Lab coming up here uh, in one week, which has been uh, quite the undertaking by the team. Big shout out to all of the folks on our team uh, that, that have worked incredibly hard on that. And we can't wait to see all of our great partners there. It's going to be a ton of fun. Pete, thanks for joining us, especially late into the evening, your time. I know uh, you live in Newcastle, but you, obviously you got to be a Man U fan. So <laughs> sure you'll be pulling for those guys this weekend. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. And uh, Matt, thanks as always. It's great to see you. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Some, and congratulations on the DeLorean uh, partnership. Thank I'm you so much. Be a lot of fun. I'm excited to see that come to fruition here real soon. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Great Pleasure to meet you. Thanks, everyone. We will see Thank you guys you. again real soon. Okay. Awesome. Happy thanks, guys. Thank you.